think I am streaming now. This is Hellmare Nightscape, Mysterio 1870, playing a Minecraft game and drinking a beer and talking to you about whatever fucking nonsense is going on in the world today. And since today is January 6th, that means there's a lot of nonsense. Inside the little Minecraft world I have going on here, which is beautiful, I intend to do two main projects. I was actually hankering for one of them. I want to get this uh, starter house built here. A big starter house with a nice big uh, storage room over here, I think. But I also have no protection at all. Like, shit, I don't even have, like, I don't have any armor. And so I don't have any coal either. It's a priority that I get down into the mines and take care of that sooner rather than later. That's my one piece of iron. Um, so I'm going to make some torches, and I'm going to go down into the mines, or I'm going to start a mine. I need that. And, um, shit, I need some food too. And then I'm going to get enough iron to feel like I'm safe because I'm playing hardcore. And then I'm going to hopefully use some of this wood and maybe farm up a little bit more to get started at least uh, improvising a starter house. And the sort of things that might be worth talking about, it's like 7 o'clock now. We'll see how long this takes me. I'll just play until I'm bored doing this. It's a pretty pretty silly way to spend one's time anyways. Um, you know, much sillier for you than it is for me, obviously. Um... I am going to just, you know, do this until I get bored doing it. So I think I could, there's a couple of places where I could start this mine. That looks like a pain in the ass. Go straight down. I'm not going to mess with that. But this other place seems pretty good. I don't know if there's a better, you know, if there's a better spot nearby. I'm going to make some bread too before I go in there. And I'm going to make these, uh, I'm going to make these torches. I got plenty of this. Do I have any other food? I do not. I could throw some of this on here before I go down, and I can, yeah, turn some of this into bread, with my bread. That'll at least be enough to get me, get me started while that cooks, I'm going to cut this tree down. So today is January 6th, which means that all the insane liberals um, believe that this is the one-year anniversary of an insurrection, I think is the word they like, or sometimes they call it a coup, and they you know, are hysterical about <laughs> about this great threat to democracy. And they attribute it to, tr you know, Trumpian forces that are insidiously striving against the forces of democracy, which, of course, they they themselves represent. Where's that motherfucker? So, uh, no zombies around. There he is. Um, and so this is ridiculous, as I'm sure you know on a variety of levels. Whoa, am I going to die right away? Um, so l let's break it down. So most notably, we don't have a democracy in the United States. Or there are probably two ways that we could really um, make this claim. Either, yeah, I suck at multitasking, by the way. But you could say we, we either don't have a democracy because that means, you know, rule by the people, and instead we have, like, a corporate oligarchy or something like this. God damn, that gets down there fast, doesn't it? Um, that makes me nervous, but I guess I'll do it. And so, if that's your take, then I think it's a sound one. And I'm spamming these torches, but I don't think I have to with this new update. We, we actually don't, you know... Um, rule ourselves even majority rule is from a like a political theory perspective a little bit troubling because that means that even in a pure democracy if you have a plurality of the people who reject a law they can still be subject to the the tyranny of the majority as they say um so so you know there's probably some dispute at the very abstract level between whether a democracy would actually take um, you know, unanimous consent, which would be impossible to achieve in any, you know, in any consistent way, especially in a large society, um, or if it, or if majority rule is the basic principle of a democracy. And, um, you know, 
on a similar note, I guess you would say, there's some question as to whether um, non-direct democracy, which is to say a democracy like we have, allegedly with representative institutions, like a, a Congress, a parliament, whether that actually passes muster as a democracy as well. Um, so you could you could raise all those points, but those are kind of like just real minor quibbles that are worth maybe getting out of the way up front, but they don't really get at what we tend to mean when we talk about uh, democracy. Like why is a, what is it that makes a democracy allegedly better than another form of government? It's the principle of autonomy, right? It's the idea that the legitimacy of the government um, when it's democratic derives not, ooh, that's quite a fall, derives not from some external source like God, you know, um, right? Like not a, not a theocracy or like the natural goodness of the rulers in an aristocracy, just to give obvious examples, um, but rather from the consent of the governed and, you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau or, or Locke or Hobbes in a more cynical vein or the theorists of this form of state. I don't know, you know, whether we want to call Hobbes a Democrat, whether we want to call any of these guys necessarily Democrats, Rousseau obviously is, um, I suppose Locke is too. They're, they're, these are sort of, Locke's sort of a classical liberal theorist of democracy. Um, Hobbes is a bit more open in that it's really just our, um, you know, fear of being caught out alone in the state of nature that makes us band together so some strong man can't kill us while we wake or some band of cowards can't slaughter us while we sleep. Um, and those sorts of theories of the state, that's a social contract theory that I'm referring to, obviously, are um, the basis of what legitimates so-called democratic rule. And in the United States, like that doesn't, and that is quite a fiction to think we have a social contract in that sense, right? Like we're not, no one ever signed up to be governed in the way we're governed. Um, the institutions we have that purport to represent the interests of you and me quite clearly do not do so unless you are, you know, like a Boeing CEO or whatever, in which case, yeah, this is doing a great job representing your interests. Uh, more power to you. But for the rest of us, we stare at the state as sort of a weird, alien, um, awe-inspiring power that's supposed to somehow be part of us, but actually stands, you know, over over against us, Gegenüber, um, over against us and, and um, dominates our lives. And when we think about it, you know, people on the left and the right disagree with the liberal orthodoxy and see pretty clearly that the state that we have here in our country works for interests, right? Powerful interests, economic interests primarily. I'm going to need another, uh, right, no biggie. Um, works for primarily uh, strong economic interests and is responsive to those and basically is an extension of those of, of finance and capital um, to use the sort of left language or of, uh, what would you say, out of touch elites. Um, uh, to use the right-wing language, which is, you know, co compelling in this case, I, I guess you could say. And then in response to that, right, so that's just a bit of background, a bit of rambling background on democratic theory. Um, and you could say much, much more about, the, you know, much ink has been spilled on that subject. But the state that we have doesn't line up with any of that, except the very cynical view I presented at the end. And so a threat to this rather obviously not democratic thing, why did I do that? That's not what I meant to do, is a threat to something that doesn't seem all that worth protecting from threats in the opinion of a lot of people, right? So when you look at the January 6th rhetoric, I mean, there's a lot of ways to sort of attack its foolishness, obviously. Um, some of which I've hinted at, but but the very first thing that you can um, point to, I think, oops, that was the wrong thing. God, it's so hard to multitask and not suck at both things. Just ramble and build axes when you need pickaxes. Um, 
the first thing you would say, I think, when you point at the January 6th riots, or rather their sort of, um, uh, you know, lunatic reception in the liberal professional spheres is, what the fuck are you guys even worried about protecting here? We're, we're obviously not a democracy, and the basic premise of your outrage is that there's there's something valuable worth protecting for the, the common people, and uh, uh, we don't see it. The other, and much more could be said about that. In fact, one thing that's worth saying, I'll come back to, is that's the, uh, I've given you a sort of liberal, um, I've given you a liberal social contract theory definition or justification, just one and the same for them, of the state. And we could circle back around if the beer doesn't distract me too much later to a Marxist, let's say, understanding of the state, which is very different and I think much more accurate and historically grounded. And, and in a nutshell, the, the state for someone who's spent a bit of time studying, oh, okay, thought that was a baddie, could be something over there. Um, if you've spent a little bit of time studying Marx, you know, or Lenin's excellent reading of uh, the Paris Commune, I think that's danger in there. We'll block it up. I'll come back to that later. Um, then you know that the state is a, a machine for the oppression of some class by another, to put it very crudely. And that, of course, looks very much like what our actual United States government is. It's one of the reasons I'm a Marxist, because, hey, that's actually a very, um, that's a much more compelling political theory. Ooh, a lot of baddies in there than the one that the liberals offer, which I suppose I kind of endorse for, I mean, a lot of us, if we haven't really thought about it, that's probably the one that we endorse to some degree or another without, without much, without much criticism or reflection. And, uh, so that's the, oh, we must preserve the democracy. And of course, that's the line of critique that suggests it's foolish to, wring your hands and clutch pearls about defending a non-existent democracy and just to cap that off needless to say the liberals um which is you know to say the the democrats with a capital d in this instance um align themselves rhetorically with with democracy they're not um it's not like they see themselves as many of us do to the the threat or aligned with the threats to an aspiration to democracy. Um, and it's not that they see themselves, or at least not, they don't present themselves, they don't represent themselves as mere, you know, sort of instruments of the oligarchic forces that I was describing earlier. Did I get enough? That's like hardly any iron. Um, rather, they, they, they say they're the Democrats... Uh, in the small d as well as the large d sense. That looks very dangerous. And on account of that, they should be protected from the unwashed hordes that the you know deplorable Trump people represent. And who are the deplorable Trump people? Those are workers, right? That's who they're talking about. Um, the liberals are not all professional class type people, who I have to say I, I generally despise. Um, with, with perhaps some exceptions here and there, but they are overwhelmingly that and have aligned themselves with that otherwise. You know, labor aristocracy, um, brainwashed workers and and elites and managers. The, the unwashed masses, workers, right? That's supposed to be who the Democratic Party is for. It's supposed to be damn sure who, who we Marxists are for. Um, are denigrated and denounced for their alleged racism and, and authoritarianism and yada, yada, yada. Um, and those accusations have some truth to them in some, in many cases, perhaps, certainly some cases, but also are way overblown and don't really, to the extent they actually diagnose a problem, they don't do anything to prevent or change it. They just uh, prevent it or change it. They just sort of use it as a mechanism for, oh, I'm going to die. There goes the hardcore world. Um, they just use it as a way to sort of shut down conversation. And I think everyone has come to realize this at this point. Let me see if I can figure out how to get out of here so I don't just immediately die. 
and I will go build some uh, some armor, at least a little bit. So that ramble is on the democratic side of things, and hence, or on the the democratic theory side of things, and hence maybe a little bit at oh shit, and it's night. I should have brought my bed. I may have really fucked up. This could be dangerous. Oh, I'm gonna die. Go hide, go hide, go hide. Yep, this is game. Oh, I'm so disappointed in myself. I was talking too much. All right, we'll try another one. <laughs> I, I'm going to start a new world right away. All right, single player, and we'll create a new world. And I'll be smarter this time. I don't know why. It's so hard to... Um, this is my 20th one that I've ever tried, but most of them end like you just saw. Um, and we want hardcore, create new world. Now you get to see it from the beginning anyways. More fun this way. Um... And I'll, I'll take this actually seriously. I'll go ahead and get resources and protect myself and not allow myself to be so easily caught out like I was there. I, I know how to play a little bit smarter than that because I've died a lot. Normally it's one of those uh, fucking um, Vex things or whatever, the little flying things that come with the raids. That's usually what kills me. Oh, this is a <laughs> this is a bit of a bummer for a start. I don't know how I feel about this. Um, too much ice. Too much snow. Give me one of these. Um, but there's some spruce over there. All right. Is it worth pursuing that direction? I feel like it's uh, cheating to just like um, jump into another world right away. You know, after the, if I don't like the start. So I'm going to go get some of this wood and see if I can take a look around and um, find some. God, it's just this. Uh, the new world generation stuff is so full of holes, it's crazy. The 1.18. So the other, um, <laughs> see how long I last till I kill myself again. So the other, I'm going to get a boat and just fucking go off somewhere. I don't like all this snow. The other big question, or I guess one of the other big questions surrounding the January 6th nonsense is, um, was it an insurrection uh, or a coup? Those are the two words that you hear the... Um, insane Democrat liberal um, nut job types using all the time. I guess I shouldn't call them insane. Their, their ideology is so contradictory, it's hard not to think there's some form of insanity. Um, you know, brain worms. I, I guess I should at least take it at face value and just say those that, you know, share, share this set of, I think, easily ridiculed beliefs. Um, they don't like just the word like you know riot or um they reject any so-called conspiracy theories on the matter even though there seems to be plenty of evidence i mean it's not, none of it's very conclusive and of course the fact checkers have all uh, claimed to have debunked it but there there seems to be a good bit of um evidence that the um you know capital Police or the FBI or the intelligence services um, or particular members of government or some combination of, of the above um, had at least foreknowledge of the events of January 6th. And rather than, uh, like, I can't make any conclusive evid you know, evidence based claims about that. Maybe others can, but I'm not really knowledgeable enough about the ins and outs. But I can tell you, I, I watched a video with a very interesting guy named Darren Beatty, who did a a sit down with um, Glenn Greenwald, who is someone I, you know, I don't agree with on everything, but but whom I admire, and uh, for for his years of sort of valuable service as a uh, as a reporter, and. Um, this guy Beatty is interesting because he was a uh, he has a he has a very interesting background. He was a Heidegger scholar, you know the German. Um, what am I doing? The German um, Nazi philosopher, probably the most important philosopher, one of um, mo most people would say he was the most important philosopher of the twentieth century, uh, at least most continental scholars would, um, and. He uh, so Beatty studied him and was a professor at Duke, um, and then became a speechwriter for Trump, uh, which is 
an odd trend. I mean, you, if you're like, oh, well, Heidegger was a Nazi, that makes sense. Maybe that's maybe that's all you have as a takeaway from that. But the idea of someone with sort of that intellectual heft, I suppose, at least what that suggests, you know, teaching philosophy at Duke and working on a, a notoriously difficult philosopher, um, you know, that it, it's not exactly the guy you would expect to support Trump. He became a speechwriter for him. And then he and he claims, you know, to, to sort of paraphrase that he was essentially blackballed for his pro-Trump views. And so he left, uh, you know, he left academia and became uh, an investigative journalist. And he um, runs a website now, I think a blog or a publication, I guess, that I, I'm not super familiar with. I only know it from the one interview with uh, Greenwald, but he, um, so he's been doing investigative journalism, which, you know, is different than just punditry. It's like actually researching facts. Um, and he discovered some sort of interesting information in the court files um, that suggest that the organizations that were instrumental in the organizing of January 6th, the, the insurrection or the riot or whatever you want to call it, that they were, I'm going to find a goddamn village this time and just camp out there, um, that those, that, that the FBI was probably, had infiltrated and had assets inside those particular organizations I, proud boys are probably like organizations and that in fact if you look at the court documents i need some food fast you will see that they um leave unnamed certain potential plaintiffs or pardon me not plaintiffs uh criminal defendants um you know they're they're naming a bunch of people as co-conspirators or what have you in the uh ins insurrection events which i put in scare quotes and then there are sort of obvious gaps in this record or in the in the um people that you would expect to be prosecuted for this and if you are familiar with the way that these court processes tend to go especially when there are when there's cooperation uh from particular defendants with the government what you see is that those folks will be left out of the indictments and so that's what you see here and there's also other information i would i would um, refer you to Beatty's article or to the greenwald interview on this that suggests that um you know one of the one of the leaders of one of these groups was in fact a, a, an intelligent or was an fbi asset and if you know anything about the intelligence community, you would know that's not like some weird stretch of the imagination. That's actually their modus operandi and the way that they sort of normally do business. I would like to have, I'd rather just fish. Are there any fish around here? Yeah, there we go. And so the long and short of it is that's just one example and you can find videos of the Capitol Police just kind of standing around. And of course, the liberals themselves are up in arms claiming that this or that member of Congress was um, part of the planning of the of what they call the insurrection. And so all of that taken together is enough to raise an eyebrow, I would say. And then in addition, you have the fact that it was just like, <laughs> it's just objectively not an insurrection. There's not or not a coup or whatever they want to call it. It was just like a handful of people walking into the Capitol and, you know, raising a little bit of hell while you could, you know, the police sort of just stood by. And so what was, you know, what are the offshoots of this? Well, two, one I mentioned, one I have it. So this has allowed the uh, liberal establishment in there echo chamber online to pretend i think that you know trump is the threat and these these workers these right wingers uh are the threat to democracy as i've already outlined and you see why i find that sort of suspicious and then in addition there's the funding for the capitol police that's come out of this right and you could also talk about 
the endless funding of uh, the you know U.S. military, etc., that's going on unabated. None of the stuff that actually is a threat to democracy, not just our democracy, but democracies around the world, none of that stuff actually has been addressed. And instead, we have this sort of theater, right? This is just pure fucking spectacle of the most, um, you know, base and obvious type. So those are my thoughts on January 6th. Um, they're not, other people have spent a lot more time paying attention to this issue than I have, so I don't want to pretend like, in fact, you can tell pretty obviously, I'm not like some big, um, I haven't mastered the facts, uh, I haven't prepared for this sort of extemporaneous little uh, diatribe I've given. That's just where I'm coming from. I, it's not something, it's something I think is funny to mock, and it's not something I take very seriously, except in the ways that I just outlined it actually is um, quite serious. And so if you agree with that, or if you disagree, you know where to find me on Twitter, obviously. And, uh, you know, so certainly feel free to... Why don't I have a bed here? I don't understand. It doesn't know how to make a bed yet? Am I missing something? Oh, <laughs> I'm so stupid. God, I'm so bad at Minecraft. I have to put this bad boy down. And now I can do it. Um, oh, and I really want a red bed. Do I have any flowers nearby? I could have a yellow bed. Oh, I'm going to go get that before it's night. I'm going to go get a red bed. Then I'm going to cook up a campfire. Or I'll start a furnace. Um, the other thing on my mind recently, I mean, you know the sort of things that are normally on my mind, but the other thing that's on my mind is this uh, story that came out in the Gray Zone. Um, Kit Kitteridge, I believe, was the author, who provided evidence via leaked documents that... Um, at least one well-known YouTuber, or bread tuber, I guess, you know, sort of quasi left, allegedly left, um, YouTuber was receiving funding from a UK government organization through a project that was spearheaded by what, you know, what I think you would have to call, um, a, a sort of psyops firm, a defense contractor, or I guess you would say intelligence contractor, um, named uh, God. What is it called? Project uh, Valent Projects, I believe, was the name of that. And it um, this oh, I forgot to get that spruce. God, I'm so bad at this. Um, Valent Projects has experience doing. I mean, I guess you would call it regime change work in Syria and sort of making some of the anti-Assad, if you'd like to call it that, forces in Syria appear super nice and secular and um, very um, accessible to or um, palatable, I guess you would say, to the temperament of the average Westerner. Um, they're like a PR firm, but they're doing government, um, you know, like re regime change PR, if that makes sense. And they were working in um, partnership with the Royal Institution, which is a, I don't know a lot about it other than through this article, but it's a, a um, government affiliated uh, UK um, sort of science, I guess, NGO. I don't think it's actually part of the government. I think it's just got ties to the government. I could be wrong about that. That um, has as its chief patron uh, Prince Charles, or uh, yeah, Prince Charles. And so they, the um, the royal institution in the UK, contracted this intelligence PR, regime change PR firm, or at least certain key players in it, to um, do anti-science anti, anti propaganda, I guess you would call it. They're selling it as pro-science education, but it's obviously um, just an attempt to prevent the online spaces that a lot of us get our information from um, from doing anything that doesn't tow the official narrative when it comes to COVID. And so the chief person implicated, if you like, although it's I don't know the degree to which she knew she was 
being sort of uh, openly, um, you, she, I mean, the the person is Abigail Thorne. the The channel is Philosophy Tube, um, and Thorne knew about the partnership with the Royal Institution, obviously, but did not necessarily know about the Valent Projects, the underlying uh, regime change stuff. I, I just don't know. I'm not sure that that evidence was provided, but there was a leaked document that showed that. Uh, philosophy too was instrumentalized by the UK government via an intelligence contracting firm, if that's the right way to put it, to um, to spread a particular narrative about COVID. And so, you know, those are the facts. I, I may be butchering some of them. I gave you the citation, Kit Kitteridge in the Gray Zone. So, you know, feel free to find me on Twitter at Mysterio1870 or um, you know, contact me via Twitch in the chat or whatever to let me know if I've, if I've fucked that up in any way. But I think that's, I think that's it. And I want to be careful about the facts here. And, um, so with those facts in hand, we're able to interpret that situation a bit, which I think I've already done. And then we can also interpret what the reaction to this has been, because to me, the most dismaying yet expected aspect of the whole episode is that so much of the American left um, doesn't really care about this kind of stuff at all. And if, you know, people are working with the CIA <laughs> or people are working with, the, um, you know, regime change PR firms, the whole thing is very murky, I admit, then as long as the left sort of agrees with the narrative that's, you know, that's being manufactured, then they don't really seem to care in a general way. Some of us obviously care, but in a general way, a lot of people are just like, yeah, yeah, we should be, everyone needs to get their vaccine. And if people are spreading anti-vax information, which that's what they always call it, if you oppose mandates, for example, um, then, you know, they shouldn't be doing that and more power to the government to shut them up or educate, as they would probably like to call it, their citizens. And so if, you're, if your ideas about leftism involve not opposing, um, you know, infiltration and co-optation by intelligence agencies, then you've really deviated quite far from even recent trends in U.S. leftism, right? You, the, the sort of 60s radicals for all their faults would not um, be pleased to learn that their successors now in the contemporary left spaces, as we like to call them, um, <laughs> are siding with the CIA or the, the Royal Institution or Valent Projects or what have you. That is just so um, so far beyond the pale that I don't know that you could really call those two forms of leftism even like the same thing. They seem diametrically opposed on a crucial point and, and on many other points as well. Identity politics, um, Marxism, imperialism, um, racism, uh, etc. And so I don't know that... It needs some huge explanation here. I think this is very obvious what my position is. Oh, good. I see. I had such a good start last time, and I was really worried that by playing so fast and loose, I haven't played hardcore Minecraft in forever, so I really fucked that last game up. But it happens. Um, but by playing so fast and loose with my Minecraft, I've been able to talk a little bit more. Oh, this is a nice place. A little bit more cogently, I hope, about the, the few subjects here that I wanted to to spend some time talking about. These birch trees are so fucking tall. I've never been in one of these crazy type forests. Um, so the reaction, just to get back to the subject at hand, although it's easy to be sort of distracted by Minecraft. It's kind of a fun, interesting, weird game. You know, it's just open sandbox. You just do whatever the fuck you want. And you can see why I don't like that. Yes, all right, awesome. Look, a jungle. Okay, this is, I'm, I like this starting, this is just as good as the last one. Look at all that bamboo. That's going to be great. Is that a fucking village? What is that? Is that a village? I see something right there. Is that a good guy, bad guy? What is it, a skeleton with a hat on? What is that? 
What is it? This is a skeleton. Is this a skeleton? I'm swimming right towards it. No! It, I'm so stupid. It's a, a ruined portal. Um, okay, well, that's fine, too. There's probably some goodies in there. Let's go see. I'll talk about Minecraft for a second, then I'll get back to the, uh... I'll get back to the other thing I was talking about, because this is good. Let's see what we got here. No, none of that. Anything good? Yes, all kinds of cool stuff. That is a great little... That is a great little boost. I don't think I can claim that stuff. I don't have any... I think I'll just break it. If I try to take that gold now, I'll have to come back and get it later. Um, I guess I should take a screenshot. No, I don't really... Well, alright. I wanted to come back and get this bamboo, too. Where am I? 800... A thousand. That's a ridiculous place to be. Um, so I'm gonna... Should I settle down here? Look how thick this is. But, like, settling on the edge of this jungle... That's pretty appealing to me. I think I'll settle over here, though. Um, I saw cows earlier, too. I like to settle near cows and sheep for obvious reasons. I see a sheep over there. I think I'll be able to get all of my... Like, I don't have to settle here long term. Oh, there's a duck. But at least in the short term, I can build a life for myself and my future villager family around here. I just wanted to swim around, or boat around a little bit to see if I could find a village first, though. Because sometimes you'll just see them. And if I, I found two immediately last game before those fucking skeletons got me. Um, bastard skellies. But I, I, um, <laughs> land a pig. This is cool. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be happy here. This is a good place. Where, where, where to go? Where to go? All right. Well, I like all that birch, but I'd rather look at it than live there. Over there, maybe that makes more sense. What is that a big oak tree? Hmm. I'm just gonna go start finding a place. I'm gonna go back here. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna explore too much. It's about to get night. Let me just go back to this little forest right here, and we'll see if this is maybe an okay place to to set up shop. I need to get inside. Or I have a. I have a bed. I'm fine. I don't care. Oh, I don't want to run off the edge here. No, 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 no! Yeah, that's a, an abrupt drop. Um, so I've talked a little bit uh, online. Oh, I thought it was a total fall-off. Um, with other people who purport to be, you know, leftists about the... Um, I think we're all kind of in agreement about the January 6th stuff. Like, oh, that is stupid nonsense. Not everyone feels that way, but the people that don't are uh, pretty clearly liberal, even if they purport to be socialists. Sometimes they'll be like socialists and they'll have a hammer and a sickle and then they'll, everything out of their mouth will be liberalism. And I'm happy to talk some other time about why I think liberalism is to be opposed for any thinking person. But for the, uh, all right, I'm going to play this shit. I'm going to actually be really safe here. I'm going to dig into the mountain. I'm going to get myself a little home. Hobbit hole to start out with, and people are not going to be able to just jump out and murder me like they did last time. That was a learning experience. I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to learn in that way because I've learned oh so many times before. Um, shit. But I, uh, I did learn. I did learn that way. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna just go into this mountainside here and make my life much easier. Uh, get one of these two, and I need this. And so, um, when I talk to people about the other incident, though, the, the PSYOPs, I, and it's not my forte, like, that's not, I, I studied political science in school, and that's not the sort of shit they teach you. They do it in the PSYOPs in most universities. Um, they, they don't, um, oh, hey, hey, Death Leopards. Um, I died. You didn't see. This is a new world. I fucked up. I, uh, if you watch the beginning of the video, I, uh, I got killed by fucking skeletons. Um, I knew it was going to happen. I just didn't know it was going to happen so soon. But this is a better place. I have um, I have oak and birch, which you know I like. I brought some spruce saplings already, which I really like. There's a dark oak forest nearby. And most importantly, there's a jungle with a shitload of uh, bamboo. So I have all the resources for the early game that I would want. I even have a, already cut one piece of pole. Now I'll, I'll make some charcoal. Um, yeah, I have high hopes for this world too, Death Leopard. Like, I'm gonna play this a lot smarter than I did last time. As you can see, I'm gonna go ahead and get shelter. And when I start mining, I'm actually gonna mine here. So this is not gonna be a total, <laughs> total fucking travesty like it was, uh, like it was last time. I'm gonna get me some oak doors. 
Like, I'm just going to try to take this seriously. But yeah, uh, Death Leopards, I was talking, I was rambling on to myself, I guess, about um, January 6th for a while. So, you know, feel free to, to look at that if you want later. Um, and I was also just now talking a little bit about the Abigail Thorne incident where the bread tuber was demonstrated to have worked in cooperation with, um, you know, an intelligence contractor, essentially. And the reaction from the online left, uh, such as it is, appears to basically be like a shrug. And I find that super weird because I should say why. I mean, there's, there's, I used to think that way too. Like, if you just read theory, you know, um, or if you just sort of come to... If, if socialism for you is democratic socialism and you're still essentially a liberal, then you have a lot of confusion and very little reason to be distrustful of intelligence agencies. You've probably fallen for a good bit of their um, propaganda, in my opinion. And if you have um, come to it come to leftism, so to speak, from, say, reading a bunch of Marx and Lenin, they don't, they're not really talking about the threat that, the, the threats that we face today, which are quite different in some ways, not always, but in many ways, quite different than those that they faced, um, although there were police at the time. And so you don't really get, like, a dissertation on the equivalent of the CIA from Marx, um, at least not in the, the main text that we read. Uh, and so a lot of leftists are really babes in the woods when it comes to talking about the way that intelligence agencies work. And a lot of right-wingers are much more sort of on the ball. And, and maybe a lot of people who are, I don't know if you could say right-wingers, more like the type of folks that um, oppose the center, right, that, are, that represent the margins and oppose the center and reject a sort of left-right framework for this, uh, for politics. Oops, wrong button. And um, it's hard for us as leftists, I guess, to listen to, <laughs> listen to people who don't absolutely agree with us on everything all the time. Um, and so I'm going to just go ahead and burn some of this shit, too. Um, so we ignore them, and that's a lot of what I saw going on with the online shift, too. That as soon as I said, like, hey, tech, it, look at this Gray Zone article, which there's another Gray Zone article about the NED, which is a, a front for the CIA, as I, I'm sure you know, um, essentially working in cooperation with the DSA. I showed people the Thorn article, get a shrug, and then immediately they say, oh, it looks like a lot of New World Order, you know, right-winger types are into this. This looks like tabloid journalism to me. And if you show them the DSA stuff, then they basically just act like it's not visible to them. They just totally ignore it. And it's very troubling to me. The NED is um, National Endowment for Democracy is sort of when... It, it's the regime change arm of the CIA, if you want to put it that way. Um, and the the history of that, um, you know, nefarious organization is really interesting, and maybe I'll get a chance to do a deep dive on that sometimes. But all of that to say, for a contemporary leftist, it looks like the intelligence agency stuff is just, well, basically to be abandoned to the, um, to the other side, to the, to the right way. They don't want to have any part of it. And uh, that's not very good reasoning, in my opinion. Like, oh, the right wingers think this is think X is true, therefore negative X must be true. Um, yeah, Death Leopards is saying I, I have to keep reminding myself that uh, everyone is susceptible to propaganda, including myself. So we must never stop asking questions and be skeptical as possible. Yeah, I agree. Um, we shouldn't be paranoid. We shouldn't. I think you know. I, I think I'm agreeing with you, and I add. We don't need to um, claim that everyone who disagrees with us is a, a CIA operative or something like this. I mean, you could you could certainly take this to an extreme. I'm not suggesting you are, um, but you, you know, I'm not suggesting that you're doing that. But it is there is a danger there on that side of just uh, oh, well, every single person that's not immediately and exactly identifiable 
uh, or, or doesn't identify with my political views is therefore not just wrong or wrong-headed, but also, you know, on the payroll of some government agency. But it's, I mean, that's not the only way propaganda works, as I'm sure you're pointing out, right? It's, um, works through the schools, works through family connections, can work through your labor union, it certainly works through the media, works through the movies. I mean, look at the Marvel movies, right? The, the two big heroes are a weapons manufacturer and a guy dressed like an American flag. Uh, that's fucking propaganda. Uh, by the way, I've only ever had two celebrity crushes, and then they both got cast in, in Marvel Universe shit, and so it kind of ruined it for me as someone who's not... You know, no offense to those who are, I know they're very popular, but I, it's not really my cup of tea. Um, so all of that just to say, yeah, propaganda is everywhere, and it's not always the CIA you know, that's behind it. But the CIA is behind... Oh, it's my friend. I sent her that text. Uh, I sent her the tweet about Elmo and Rocco. And uh, I'm sure she's responding to that. Um, the CIA is not behind everything, but the CIA does have partnerships in Hollywood. They, for example, work on um, the Tom Clancy-based show, which is... If you know anything about Tom Clancy, you know that's there's reasons for that, right? His heroes are CIA operatives, and uh, they have, you know, agency representatives that help plan the representation of the CIA in that show, and the partnership between the U.S. military and, and weapons uh, contractors in Hollywood is long documented. You know, even my favorite director, uh, Stanley Kubrick, uh, worked with NASA on um uh, 2001 space odyssey yeah i agree death leopards anything tom clancy is at the very least pro uh, military industrial complex yeah and and sort of openly and proudly so it's not uh that's not some wild accusation they're they're the cooperation between the mic and the what do you want to call it the sort of spectacle industrial complex that is hollywood is open and blatant and touted as a virtue it's like the way they get funding on some of their you know like you want a fighter jet in your in your movie we'll just go into partnership with the u.s air force rather than having to cgi in one they're they're, they're part of the industry they're part of the movie industry as much as they're part of many other industries you can go on with example after example um I mean, I don't want to just, I do today, but in general, I'm not, I don't want to just talk about the CIA all the time. I just think that these recent episodes have showed, or recent events have showed that the left, or at least the online U.S. left, doesn't understand what's going on in terms of narrative management. And I'm, I'm 100% admitting that I've been guilty of this myself, and I'm trying to remedy that. And so, you know, Anderson Cooper ex-CIA, so-called. I don't know how you can ever be ex-CIA, but he interned with the CIA when he was a kid. Now he's a, you know, he's a Vanderbilt. He's from a millionaire family. And, and now he's like the guy that gives you the news. You can see how this might be problematic. And it's worth pointing out just in passing, it's like, um, you know, our society has really taken on all these sort of aspects that, anti-communists have always attributed to communism right uh, like they're like oh you know no one has any power there's a huge alien distant bureaucratic apparatus the information is manufactured the narratives are all fabricated everyone has to sort of bow to us um uh, uh, an unquestionable authority like we have like the the soft totalitarianism here already um and you know, the political theorist, I, I would really recommend a, uh, an interview that Chris Hedges did. It's very long. It's hours and hours long with the political theorist Sheldon Rowland, who is actually a bit of a, my, my grad school training is in his family tree, so to speak, because um, my dissertation supervisor, supervisor was supervised by Hannah Pitkin at Berkeley, who was a, a colleague or I guess a student colleague of, uh, of Wolin. And so I sort of traced my, you know, academic credentials back to, to Wolin, even though he's another, like Chris Hedges, 
Um, these guys are both, you know, anti-communist leftists. And so I obviously disagree with them on certain very key matters um, and I'm suspicious of them. I want a stone cutter. I need to get some, some iron too. Um, but yeah, exactly, Death Leopards, you're exactly right. Inverted totalitarianism is the, the concept in the, the very good book by Sheldon Wolin that I, despite, like, he's, his reading of Marx, he has, a, he has a really famous book called Politics and Vision. That's like his masterpiece. It's really long. I have it over on my bookshelf. I can, I don't see it. Otherwise I just grab it, but it, it's, it's hanging out over there. Oh, I do see it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not that I can show it to you, but it is 700 and something pages long, and it was published in two parts, I think. I think he wrote um, wrote it and then came back and sort of added on to it. His reading of Marx in this is really fucking trash. Wolin's reading of Marx is absolute garbage. It reminds me of very little more than it reminds me of Jordan Peterson's reading of Marx. Focuses almost exclusively on the manifesto. It's just like every... Um, every sociology 101 version of Marxism that you would ever, ever encounter in your worst nightmares, you know? And his reading of Nietzsche is similarly quite, quite bad. That's not all there is in the world, though. And some of his other work, I think, is pretty good. And his other book, right, not the one I'm talking about now, Politics and Vision, that I, the Nietzsche and Marx sections are garbage. To, to, in my opinion, as someone who's a big, you know, I stand Nietzsche and, and Marx. Uh, those are two of my favorite and I think most important uh, thinkers, uh, at least in the way I see the world. Um, his other book on inverted totalitarianism is actually just provides a, a really useful, admittedly non-Marxist, but still really useful framework for understanding the challenges we are up against and his extremely long interview with Chris Hedges is just really great one of my friends in grad school actually interviewed Wolin she wrote, she wrote her dissertation on him and so she interviewed him right before he died like you know weeks before he died actually very, probably one of the very last uh, interviews he did and so we talked about him a lot she was a much bigger fan she also really dug Hannah Arendt and these are you know, these are not my people uh, these are not my people at all, and we, you know, had sort of a falling out over some political, diff not, you know, sometimes um, when you hold political stances very strongly, and they're not just external views, but become part of your life, and you act on them, um, it is possible to have um, unfortunate personal and, and career consequences as a result. I think a lot of us have been through that. And you learn in those times, you know, who your true friends are. And so it was unfortunate that I learned she was not not, not um, a true friend in that sense. But I value the conversations we had, and we talked about Woolen a lot. And on account of that, on account of her interest in, in Woolen, I, I read a bunch of him. Some of it I read and reread, trying to figure out why he was so fucking dumb sometimes and so brilliant other times. But he's right about the inverted totalitarianism stuff. And I think the other set of theorists here who get at this are the you know sort of <laughs> french post-structuralists to, to paint with an overbroad brush so you have uh obviously uh discipline and punish and the other writings by foucault from that time period again foucault not someone i like we don't i don't think we would get along politically but his insights are extremely valuable and i've spent way too much time reading Foucault. I probably have read more Foucault than just about any anyone else, uh, you know, probably Marx included. And someone I do admire, someone I do think is pretty awesome is uh, Gilles Deleuze, who has a very short postscript on the societies of control that is a, like sort of an introduction to um, Discipline and Punish. And uh, it's really short. It's very well worth reading. And it's very prescient in its diagnosis of the sort of you know willing surveillance that social media represents and um you know uh co consensual uh con consent to domination that much of our um current uniform mindset 
uh, represents and the sort of like mass disciplining and policification of our of our whole lives I think Deleuze gets at it in just a you know a few paragraphs a few pages and uh, so I'd really recommend that and of course the other guys that are useful here are folks like Guy the board whose society of the spectacle is you know provides a, a vocabulary for describing all of, all of this sort of stuff but again none of this gets you really at the nuts and bolts of propaganda and um, you know like the sort of history uh, like you know if you had a better a better more robust and updated version of uh, uh, manufacturing consent right the book that Chomsky co-wrote um, then that would be maybe more like what what I kind of feel like we're missing and of course Chomsky again another you know, notorious, I guess you would say, um, anti-communist leftists. It's amazing how many of these guys there are floating around opposing, you know, opposing capitalism in, in words, but, you know, obviously on my, on my view, if you're not willing to act to establish a worker state, essentially, to actually oppose communism and, or, or to oppose capitalism. Sorry, it's probably a Freudian slip. Maybe I'm a CIA agent. Um, to, to oppose capitalism indeed, rather than just a word, then are you really opposing it? Um, so, what was that, about an hour? Seems like a long time to just talk. I'm so sad I died. This is a very, um, you know, inauspicious little beginning, I guess. It looks like kind of like not a lot going on. I need to go get some food soon, but I promise you that this will wind up becoming quite the hobbit hole before too long. And I'm really looking forward to exploring this area around here. As you can see, I have a great little forest. I just threw some stupid granite down for the moment, but this is going to be pretty. We'll go out and chop down a bunch of birch trees. I'll clear all of this out and basically set up my planned kingdom that I wanted over here. I'm sure I can explore enough and find a village. I'll go get some bamboo. We'll set up an iron farm. We'll start uh, getting some mending trades going on here. And this is going to be really neat. And I'm going to make it look pretty. And I'm going to not die immediately because I'm going to dig safely inside this well-protected cave and put up some actual protection around it. And I'll fence in this area before too long so the skeletons won't get me. And I'll play super, super safe so we don't have another death. Um, I appreciate it, Death Leopards. It means a lot to me that you are willing to spend some time with me. It's really cool. Um, you have me on Twitter, so feel free to hit me up if there's something on your mind that you'd like to talk about, and I'll be happy to look into it some, and we can um, we can do some chat, and I'll, I'll do my, my monologuing on another, whatever subject you want to talk about. I know the stuff that I'm interested in would be maybe talking a little bit more about theory. So I've been reading a lot of Lenin recently, and I'm trying to work through capital again. So that's the stuff I, I sort of have at my fingertips. So I'll probably spend some time talking about uh, state and revolution next time. And I have a couple of articles that I wrote a while back on democratic socialism and, you know, the problems of social chauvinism as exemplified by Bernie Sanders. So I may summarize some of that stuff too. So I look forward to seeing you. I'm going to try to stream, you know, you do, obviously you can come stop by whenever you want. Um, but I think I may stick to around this time and just try to stream uh, every day or so to see if that's too much. And if so, I'll back off to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. My schedule is kind of open right now, but it's about to get really crazy because um, I'll have uh, classes starting up, and uh, we, we could always talk about that kind of stuff too. So it's a pleasure, comrade, uh, and anyone else who's taken the time to watch this. Sorry for my death. I'll do better by you next time, and uh, the only thing to die will be the ducks. All right, peace out.